Okay, let's do it. Let's, I will hand over and welcome. This is our Oxford SU's uh, virtual fair. You found it, you're in, so, so well done. You already know that. Um, this is our um, fourth, is it one, two, three, fifth session. We're absolutely flying through, we're halfway through our live event program. Um, so do check out all the live events on the auditorium page that you came through. There's lots coming up. Um, but right now, um, please hand over to Dr. Helen Swift um, to give us the introduction, the start of our international students, what you need to know session. Um, so over to you, Helen. Very much Ben. Uh, I am assuming I am audible. If fellow panellists could give a thumbs up to indicate I am, that'd be great. Thank you very much. Um, so welcome everyone to this webinar dedicated to you as international students and we ambitiously intend in 45 minutes to tell you what you need to know in three key areas. Um, academic essentials, social life and visas and healthcare. So this will be a three-part presentation and we hope to have time at the end for your questions. Um, there are going to be a number of us contributing to the webinar and we'll introduce ourselves as we appear for our respective part of the presentation. Um, so first part is academic essentials. Slide please, Ben. Perfect, thank you. Um, so this is my part, uh, so I should say who I am. Um, I'm Helen Swift. I'm an associate professor in the Modern Languages Faculty and at St Hilda's College, uh, where I've been teaching now for almost 16 years. And it's each year a real joy to welcome you all as new students from across the world. I just want to start by saying that I really hope it's a positive and fruitful time for you intellectually and in as many other ways as possible. The most important takeaway from my part is that we, and here I'm speaking on behalf of your tutors, course directors and supervisors, want to support you in setting you up to succeed on your course, whether you're an undergraduate, postgraduate taught student or postgraduate researcher always feel that we are here to be approached for help. So my role isn't to give you fresh information so much as to help you navigate through all the information and content that you've already received from your course, from your department or from your college. And I want to do this by drawing out some of the essential points that can be distinctive to the approach to teaching and learning here and that you might find contrast with styles you've experienced before. Slide please. Could you advance? Thank you. Um, so it's primarily about matching up expectations, yours as students and ours as tutors. And I'm just going to say tutors as shorthand for course directors, supervisors, etc. But henceforth, I have three main aims for my next 13 minutes. First, to ensure you have an underpinning understanding of Oxford's approach to teaching and learning. Second, to clarify your sense of some key aspects of your working practice what you'll be doing, how you'll be assessed, how you'll get feedback. And thirdly, to help you best manage this period of transition into the first term, so you're set up to give of your best academically and really thrive on your course. Slide, please. In the same way that I have three aims, I have three caveats or refrains, if you like, that I'd like you to keep in mind throughout. Um, the first is that diversity is the norm in Oxford, and I mean this in a couple of ways. All the specifics of your academic working life will be discipline specific and course specific. So there's going to be inherent variety, for instance, in what essay writing looks like between subjects. Then alongside that variety, there's no sense of any fixed model or formula to follow in order to succeed. No single best way to do things, and I'll come back to that in a bit. Second, if you're feeling uncertain or a bit overwhelmed right now, you are not alone. And if that lasts a little while, you are also not alone. Um, I've included a bit of clip art on the screen, uh, which by way of image description shows an arm brandishing a help sign emerging from behind a desk that's piled high with papers and a computer monitor. Settling down academically takes time. It's an uneven process and you will share significant parts of that unevenness with UK students as well. My third point is about identity. We're identifying you today as a specific group as international or non-UK students, but there will be all sorts of ways in which you feel and develop your identity whilst you're here that are and are not related to that. You're here first and foremost as an individual person, and it's our privilege as academics to encounter each of you that way. 
Also bear in mind that amongst academic teaching staff, around 40% or so are themselves from EU or international backgrounds. So there's a global breadth of educational experience amongst your tutors as well. Slide, please. So what's most distinctive about Oxford's approach to teaching and learning that might feel different from other, some other educational cultures? I think there are two key interrelated features, namely that your learning is strongly self-directed, but also that it is a relationship between you and others. So let me explain what I mean. By self-directed, I'm meaning firstly that you take charge of your timetable. There are lectures, classes, labs, tutorials, seminars or supervisions as scheduled hours, but that also leaves a lot of work time that isn't filled. And that's where you are reading, researching, preparing problem sheets, practicing techniques, etc. For those of you working remotely this term, questions of timetabling may have additional complexity because of differences in time zone. Your tutors will be aware of needing to manage things to work for everyone. But you might also want to think with a special care about the hours when you're normally most productive and how to mesh those with your scheduled commitments. The second thing I mean by self-directed picks up on what I said about identity before. Your tutor selected you because of your individual mind, your way of thinking. What's expected, and hopefully very much what you feel you want from the degree course here from having applied, is your independent critical engagement. You're here to digest material, process it, think about it, assess it, interrogate it, discuss and challenge it. You're not receiving learning from your tutors, deferring to them as subject specialists and then recycling it. You're doing the learning in dialogue with them. And this brings me to my point about learning as a relationship. This concerns you and your tutors, as well as you and other students. With your tutors, you may find that the nature of communication within tutorials and seminars is more informal, free flowing and open than in some other systems. It's a kind of mutual respect and trust that's not about hierarchy or keeping intellectual distance. We are, after all, all here to learn from each other. With other students, you'll hopefully have really valuable intellectual cooperation and collaboration within and outside the classroom. You'll want to challenge each other's views, but you're not competing against each other. There isn't a fixed number of firsts or distinctions to chase when you're being assessed. Next slide, please. Mentioning assessment brings me to examinations and feedback. The fundamental purpose of your degree here is for you to become the best scientist, linguist, historian, geographer, etc., that you can be. It isn't to train you to perform in exams. It can feel very strange not having a regular string of marked assessments but it's really core to what we're doing to help you develop. I strongly encourage you to read your course specific information about types of assessment and assessment criteria and to discuss them with your tutor at an early opportunity. So you're clear about what's expected of you and what you can expect. For those of you whose courses include timed exams, there's the opportunity for exam practice. The grading structure at Oxford is largely the same as at most other UK institutions, in that your final result is classified for undergraduates as a first, two, one, two, two, et cetera, for postgraduate taught courses, distinction, merit or pass. The numerical scale for all degree courses is normally out of 100, such that a mark of 70 or above means a first or a distinction. So achieving 70% is a mark of excellent work. If you're coming to Oxford from a system where excellence means 90% and 70% could mean average or even a C grade, this will obviously require some recalibration. I cannot reiterate enough that the most helpful thing to do is to discuss your progress with your tutors so you have a good sense of how what you're doing is in line with expectation. What tells you how you're doing along the way when you're not being continually marked and assessed is feedback. Feedback has several forms, written comments on pieces of tutorial or seminar work, 
reports at the end of each term, but also, and really importantly, oral discussion of your work during your tutorial seminars or supervisions. Feedback isn't dispensed to you, it's an ongoing discussion. The fact that you're not being formally marked on everything you do gives freedom to experiment with different styles and approaches. Your tutors will encourage you to try out new things that might be more or less successful on a week to week basis. And that's a hugely important part of learning. It's not a consistent upwards line of achievement. Intellectual development at this level doesn't work like that. It's a much more variable trajectory. And to underscore a point I cannot overemphasize, it's your individual trajectory, no one else's. Next slide. So I think I've now drifted into working practices and things you might find different in relation to previous experience. And I'll just pick out a few elements. And I stress again, there'll be course specific nuance to everything. Firstly, note taking. It's really important for all students to get into good habits about how you make notes. Your course handbook and tutors can offer guidance relevant to your subject, but as a general rule, it's highly unlikely that you'll frequently be copying or downloading word for word. Wherever you are doing so, be meticulously careful about referencing and attribution. It might be the case that your tutor asks you to prepare notes for discussion in class. What does that mean exactly? If what's being requested isn't clear to you, be sure to ask for clarification. It's of primordial importance to your tutors that you understand what you're doing. Second, a word about essay writing. Linked to what I've said before, essays that you're writing for a tutor are for offering your response to a topic to start developing your own critical voice. Now you might feel quite uncertain about this initially and that's entirely expected. That development is very much an ongoing enterprise and it may well require some adjustment from an essay writing style that you've used before elsewhere. Thirdly, academic English. A source of worry for many non-UK students can be managing the intensiveness of your course's demands in what isn't necessarily your first language or grasping securely the approaches and conventions of academic English writing in a specifically UK context. The Language Centre offers ongoing help and support with this, and some of you may already have completed their precessional course. If you're concerned about this aspect, do speak with your tutors who are sensitive to the challenges facing students in all sorts of ways. For instance, if initially you're finding it hard to get through the volume of reading required at the pace necessary. Ask for guidance to make sure that you're starting with priority items. If you're finding intervening in video conference a challenge because you feel you need more time to formulate what it is you want to say, or your confidence is wobbling. Again, your tutor can suggest ways of supporting your participation. Don't ever feel that you can't ask, or that a tutor won't listen to your concerns seriously, sympathetically and want to help with discretion. Next slide, please. So that brings me to my final point, which gestures outwards to the other parts of this presentation. And that's how your tutors recognize that your academic life doesn't exist in a vacuum separate from everything else in your life, especially right now. If something is affecting you in one area, such as your mental health or a family situation, it will almost inevitably affect another area of life, including your academic work. Now, it might feel strange to contemplate telling your academic tutor about something ostensibly unrelated to your studies, but we would truly like to know so that we can point to sources of support that are appropriate to your circumstances and, of course, exercise confidentiality in anything that you tell us. I mentioned at the start that I'm a linguist and my concluding wish for you is about language and belonging. I've been saying in my talk, we representing my academic colleagues and you designating you as students. But what I truly hope is that you feel this year as much sense as possible of a collective us that makes this place academically yours. My very best wishes for the coming year. And I'll now pass over to colleagues from the Oxford SU International Campaign to talk about social life.
Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to this part of the presentation. Um, just to check, can everyone hear me all right? Um, if my colleagues could. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so I'm Chechi, I'm the communications officer um, at the International Students Campaign, IHC for short, and I'm here with Wesley, our co-chair, and Andrew um, to talk to you guys about social life at Oxford. Um, slide Ben, please. And I'm gonna start with um, the basics, so settling in. Um, most of you guys will have been here um, for about a few days now, possibly a week, some of you longer, because um, some colleges do International Freshers Week. Um, and you will probably be getting to know the city um, by now. Um, so we wanted to start with something, some suggestions about places to go um, and things to visit. So Oxford is a very unique city. Um, it has loads of history, loads of culture, um, but especially it also has loads of green space, which is not something that you initially um, think about, at least I didn't think about when I got here. Um, and I think this year, more than ever, with um, you know anxieties of a coronavirus and things like that, it would um, there's loads of opportunity to um, places to go walk. For example, Port Meadow, as you can see, we have a map here um, um, with the different parks that you can walk in, Port Mellow, Uni Parks, South Parks, Christchurch Meadows. Um, roughly the center of town is where it says Oxford University Shops and Jericho, that is roughly the center of town. So Oxford is quite a bit bigger than we may realize. Um, there's Westgate Shopping Center, which has loads of fun activities that you guys can go and explore. Um, and then Corn Market Street and the High Street are where most food um, and shopping essentials are usually located. Um, there's a big Tesco at the end of Corn Market Street, which is the main shopping chain here where you can do your groceries. Um, I also just wanted to briefly mention um, the cultural differences, because obviously um, moving to a different country is a really big step. Um, and it's one that we're all very proud of you for doing. Um, when I moved to the UK, I'd never been here before. Um, and so there are some cultural differences that you will need to be aware of. Um, for example, well, um, for example, things around like the drinking culture or the fact that body language um, is a little bit different here or that people tend to um, be less um, okay with physical contact and things like that. Um, there's loads of different brands in stores um, so when I walked in into my first store, um, the first time I walked into Tesco, I was very surprised because I could only re recognize about four brands. Um, but even though all of these things may seem challenging at first, um, you get used to them quite quickly. And with the help of other people that you get to know, there's always people within your college who will be willing to show you the ropes and kind of introduce you to lots of really fun aspects of British culture. Um, and one of these things, for example, is the slang. Um, so there's lots of um, lots of words which I didn't know what they meant. So um, a few examples are peng means um, like great, amazing, or beautiful. Um, class means excellent. Uh, minging means the opposite, awful. And there's, there's things like that. But the more that you live in the UK and the more that you um, make friends from um, your college, the more you will kind of get used to um, all of these things that may, you know, seem, they may seem strange at first, but um, you settle in quite quickly and it is a really wonderful experience um, to be able to study here. So I'm going to hand over to Wesley for the next slide. Hey everyone, uh, I hope you've been enjoying your first week at Oxford. Uh, as Cecilia said, my name is Wesley and I'm co-chair of the International Students Campaign. Uh, so I'm going to go over several practical things about living at Oxford. First, gowns. Normally, you would be wearing this to matriculation and your exams. But of course, with everything going virtual now, you might not need to buy a gown immediately. But anyway, there are several places to get a gown at Oxford. If you're an undergraduate student, Walters and Shepherd and Woodward are both 25 quid for a cap, gown and bow tie and the Oxford University shop is slightly more expensive, but they also have student discounts sometimes, especially for freshers. 
And if you're a postgraduate student, your gown will probably be a bit more expensive. So you could look into buying gowns from alumni at your college or via the Oxford Gowns Marketplace on Facebook. Uh, lots of people uh, sell gowns there. So um, yeah, you can save quite a lot of money by buying them from uh, buying them secondhand. And next, in terms of cell phones, if you haven't gotten a UK SIM card, you should get one soon. Uh, there are several types of phone plans here. Uh, one of them is contract plans. You should probably avoid this, particularly if you're on a one-year course, because you might be committed to paying an entire year or even two years of uh, phone fees. There are several companies that offer monthly plans, including Voxy by Vodafone and GiftGab by O2. If you use a really small amount of data, you could consider getting a pay-as-you-go plan from free. But for most people, a monthly plans are probably a better deal. And lastly, uh, student discounts. A lot of restaurants and retailers in Oxford and in the UK have student discounts. Uh, you can take a look at uh, the app Student Beans, Uni Days, and Percent. These discounts are usually around 10 to 25%, so you can actually save quite a lot. And aside from that, you could consider getting a 16 to 25 rail card. It costs 70 pounds and it entitles you to a 33% discount on all train tickets for three years. So um, this adds up really quickly. For example, if you get a train ticket to London, which usually costs 20 something pounds, you already save like seven pounds. So if your course is only one year, you can also get a one year card for a lower price. And um, an NUS totem card from the National Union of Students, it will give you a 10% off at co-op supermarkets if you use the card. This is particularly useful if you're going to be living in Jericho or Cowley since there are several co-op stores there. And lastly, if you're interested in studying a language in your free time at Oxford, you can take a course at the Oxford University Language Center. You'll only have to put pay the student price, which is a bit cheaper. But on top of that, if you do an intensive course, uh, basically a one-year language course with weekly classes, uh, most colleges will give you a 50% rebate once you finish the class. So it's a really great opportunity to uh, learn a new language, and I would really recommend it. So passing on to Andrew. Great. Thanks, Wesley. Um... Hi everyone, um, I'm, I'm Andrew and I am the Director of Change uh, for the International Students Campaign. And I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, what you can expect or what you can join um, to, you know, to make friends and to meet other people uh, within the university and in other colleges. So obviously you have the national societies, which uh, most of you might be already familiar with because some, if not uh, many of the international societies try to get in touch with, um, you know, students coming into the university. So you might already have uh, you might already know people within uh, some of these societies that are on the slide. And obviously it's a great way to meet a bunch of people from the same cultural background. A lot of these societies also organize events which you can attend, such as like cultural dinners, or for example, if you know back home there's a national event going on, they might wanna have a little party over here to celebrate um, that you can attend and meet uh, other people from the same country and get to know them better. Um, you also have um, sort of the wider national society. So you know, off the top of my head, um, there's something like the OUAPS, which is the Asia Pacific Society, which tends to have, you know, attendance, you know, widely varying between members of the different societies, um, the different Asian societies and the events they put on are really interesting because you get to meet, you know, other people, they're not just from, your, from, from the same country, but other people from different countries as well and get to hear their experience um, settling into Oxford and what they're finding difficult or different and I mean, at the end of the day, it's a great support system. Um, there will be, I mean, in opposite terms, not easy. And there will be days where you might be feeling, you know, a little lonely, a little down. And having these people that you could, you know, fall back on and kind of talk to is, is a really great um, thing to have. And obviously, you could, you know, have a look at the Oxford International Society. The link is there. And give that page a, a follow just to sort of catch up on what events um, they're holding. Obviously. Um, in, in, this, in this sort of COVID situation, um, a lot of in-person events can't go on, but I'm sure that, you know, whatever socially distanced form that a lot of these events would take would, you know, end up building the same experience as you would in a normal term. 
and international, some international, uh, some colleges would have international reps to organize um, events throughout the year. You know, some colleges don't. So it's actually worth, you know, getting in touch to, to really sort of finding out, you know, what, what events your college has put on. Um, they're like cultural events like Burns Night or Chinese New Year. Um, and if your college doesn't have it, you know, maybe you might look into sort of suggesting that they should and maybe just sort of like volunteering to organize it yourself. All right, next slide, please. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, so the International Students Campaign is currently running a peer mentoring scheme. Uh, you might have received an email on Monday about this. Basically, if you sign up to the scheme, you will get matched with a current student uh, from the same country as you. They will be from a different college, and um, I would really encourage everyone to sign up for this. Uh, your mentor will be able to give, give you useful tips on settling in, in Oxford and talk to you about any general issues that you might encounter here. Um, and you'll also get to meet more people from different colleges. And hopefully you can meet in person when the epidemic, the pandemic subsides. So if you want to sign up, um, I'll paste the link in the chat box and you can also check the email that we sent out on Monday for more information. Next slide. Great, yeah, and another really great way to sort of meet people in Oxford is just to put yourself up as a volunteer. So not only is it, you know, not only will you have fun, you know, meeting new people, but you also have the sense of fulfillment of giving back to the community, which is really great, especially if, you know, uh, you, the term is filled with like, you know, academics and studying and you want to do something else in your, in your free time. So having that sort of like chance to give back uh, can really be, be beneficial for you. And um, so where, where you can get started is the Oxford Hub. The link is in the slide, uh, which is a, the Oxford Hub is a charity. It sort of focuses on running um, community support programs uh, within Oxford. And if I'm not wrong, they're having a sort of like a virtual social action fair um, on the 10th of October, I think at 2 p.m., which, you know, if you're interested in that sort of thing, to sort of find out what you can get involved in, what you can sign up for, it's probably worth attending. Um, you know, other the other opportunities of volunteering as well, you have sort of, off the top of my head, you have like, I think Keen is running a community buddies program I, I've seen that sort of match people based on the shared interests to just sort of, you know, make friends and to get in touch with each other, especially in this time of isolation. So if you know, if you, if you, if you think you might enjoy, uh, you know, these sorts of things and you think you, you might want to volunteer your free time uh, within the term for, for these initiatives, then it's probably worth checking out the Oxford Hub to, to get involved. Next slide, please. So just before we move on to our last slide, we've had a question um, in our Q&A section that I just wanted to um, briefly answer. Um, we're talking about the student work culture like, um, maybe Lauren can chip in in terms of the graduate side of things in a second, but in terms of undergraduate degrees, um, the university actually has a fairly strict policy about work during term time um, because um, the workload can get intense at certain points. And so they think that it um, would probably be sort of disruptive to learning to have a job alongside um, the um, degree that you're doing while you're in term time in Oxford. Um, but there's no restrictions on jobs outside of that and during the vacations, for example. Um, but in general, if you find yourself in a situation where it would be much more beneficial for you to have a job alongside of it, um, you can always talk to um, your tutors, your supervisors. Um, there's a, your, you know, um, the, the, the name varies between graduate and undergraduate students um, and um, work out an arrangement with them. Um, I don't know if it's exactly the same for graduate students or so if, if Lauren has more insight on this. Yeah, I can. So hi, guys, I'm, I'm Lauren from I'm VP graduates of the SU. So in terms of work culture for grad students, I would say it really depends what course you're on. So I was on a master's course where I had like quite intense eight weeks for the, each term. Um, but then during the vacation, it slowed down a bit. So I was able to have a part time job. And I, I did like take up a research assistantship during that time. Um, but in if you're on like, say, a DPhil where, you know, you're in the lab from nine to five every day. Um, then that's quite different. And, you know, it's really up to you if you want to spend your weekends working and that kind of thing. Um, I would say it's, you know, just a conversation to have with your supervisor and, you know, just realistically setting what, what works for you. I'd probably recommend 
waiting like a little bit and just figuring out, you know, like the flow of things before committing to a part-time job and also checking your, your visa and making sure that you are allowed to, to work during and outside of term time. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and then on to our last slide um, on how to plan for the vacations. Um, so um, for both um, undergraduates and graduate students, um, term is usually about eight weeks. Some, uh, depending on the degree type for graduate students, they, it might be longer um, than that. Um, but um, a lot of undergraduates will be living in college accommodation. Um, and in that case, um, the term ends on Saturday of week eight, um, which will sound like gibberish now, but um, once you start getting into um, the term, you realize that you lose all track of the date and the day of the week becomes really important but, um, because um, you know every week it's Monday of week one, it's Monday of week two, et cetera. Um, but anyway, most colleges send a form round in advance um, to apply past that date. Um, so for example, if you know that you're going to need to stay here over the Christmas vacation, um, in, you can fill in that form and apply for, you know, residency extension. Um, because of COVID-19 at the moment, most colleges will be more flexible than usual um, if a last minute arrangement has to kind of be worked out um, for unforeseen reasons, but this varies between colleges. And so the best course of actions if you're planning for the vacations is to speak to your accommodation manager at your college and see what you can work out. A lot of graduate students, some undergraduate students will also be living out in private accommodation, um, which um, typically is a year round rent, although you can get six months and things like that as well. And particularly for grad students, most students choose to remain in Oxford because of the rent and also for the ability to kind of um, explore the city when the workload isn't as intense, potentially find a job and, and things like that, especially if you're from overseas. Um, in for example, from the US or from Southeast Asia, this could be a very good option because um, going home might be a little bit more difficult. Um, in terms of the storage available to undergraduate this and graduates, this also varies across colleges. Undergraduate students tend to have a little bit more access to storage than graduate students typically. Um, but again, every single college negotiates this differently. Um, so, for example, where I'm from at Merton, um, there is an international storage room where international students can leave their um, belongings um, at any point for any of the vacations. So whether it's Christmas and Easter or the long vacation in the summer, some colleges do their storage together with UK students and um, only allow students during Easter and um, December. It really depends on the college. Um, so that's something to um, ask um, your kind of international rep if you have one or your JCR and MCR committee about in particular, and they will be able to um, point you in the right direction. Um, so yeah, this is, um, that's all from us. Um, we hope that you've enjoyed um, this, this section of the presentation and it's giving you kind of an overview on um, both fun things and things to get used to about Oxford and more kind of practical stuff. Um, and I will hand over to the next part of the presentation now. Thank you for listening. Hello, uh, I'm Jo Aldhouse and I'm here from the uh, student immigration team. Um, can you give me a wave if you can hear okay? Am I, am I coming through? Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so the, um, the student immigration team um, is, has sort of two sides to it. I'm a student visa advisor and uh, so we're here as a resource for you to um, answer any questions you might have about your visa and applying for your visa and I've been, we've been in contact with a, a lot of you over the summer it's been a particularly fraught summer for getting here one way or another and we're really pleased to be speaking to you and we hope that uh, your visa issues are mainly resolved but we're still here to help you with, with any that aren't um, and the other side of the team is to is 
uh, involved with um, managing the um, university's tier four license. So it's to do with compliance and works mainly with the colleges and departments, but is also there to help you as well. And the whole team is, the aim of the team is very much to minimize the impact of visa matters on your student life really. So you can concentrate on your academic work and the more fun things that um, Chetty and Lauren and the rest of the team have mentioned to you as well. So we're here to try and um, minimize the difficulties that visas cause you on an ongoing basis. So um, if you could move the slide on, please, Ben. We, okay, so we are here to talk to both students who've needed a visa to be here and um, European students as well as the situation is going to be changing. So we will be saying a word about that. So the first thing you might need to know now that you've applied for your visa is about collecting your tier four biometric residence permit. So this is the little card which has your visa information on it and has your the end date of um, your visa permission. Um, and you will have got a sticker in your passport to enable you to come to the UK in the first place uh, with a view to collecting your biometric residence permit after arrival. Now, we've had an awful lot of concern from students who are needing to self-isolate because you need to self-isolate for 14 days and you have a letter saying you have to pick up your biometric residence permit in 10 days. So obviously, don't break out of isolation to collect your biometric residence permit. But stay safe and self-isolated self for the full 14 days and your biometric residence permit will still be there for you to collect when, you're, when, when you come out of isolation. So don't worry about that. So where will your biometric residence permit be? So if you applied for your visa overseas, you will have been given a 90 day travel sticker in your passport and you will collect your biometric residence permit after you get here. Now, when you applied for your visa, that might seem a very long time ago now, but you will have put in a code um, to collect, to arrange to collect from the university. So if you've used this code 2HE627, then you're, otherwise you'll be collecting from St. Paul Dates Post Office. So if you're collecting from college, your biometric residence permit will be at college, contact them and they'll tell you how to, to um, get hold of it. If it's at the post office, go down to St. Paul Dates when you can and collect it. If you've completely forgotten where you're supposed to be getting it from and you didn't get a decision letter, which is happening with some students, uh, just get in, um, get in touch with us and we'll help you locate your biometric residence permit. Okay, so um, if you made your application in the UK, your biometric residence permit will be couriered um, to um, the contact address you gave on your application. Again, if it doesn't turn up, um, you can go on the gov.uk website to report that it hasn't turned up, but you can also get in touch with us and we will help you locate it. And then finally, um, just to mention, if you have arrived in the UK in advance of being granted your tier four visa and you need a tier four visa, then unfortunately you will not be able to enroll and start your course in the UK. So um, if you've done that, we did advise not to, but if, if you have managed to get here without your tier four, do get in touch and we'll help you to sort that out. Okay, so if you could move on to the next slide, please, Ben. Okay, so this card, your biometric residence permit, um, you need to check it to see that the details are correct. So check your name, um, that it has the Oxford license number on it. Um, check the start date and end of your, your course. So um, the end date of the biometric residence permit and the Home Office should have built in some extra time to your permission. So that's either going to be two months for uh, short course, um, four months for an undergraduate degree course or two year, two year masters, 
or for one year master's students, they'll get an additional bonus six months included with their visa. So check that you've got the correct end date on it. Um, if you're a one year master's student, then you come under the tier four pilot. And if the Home Office is notorious for getting the visa end dates wrong with that. So if your end date's wrong, just hang on because we're going to be emailing out instructions to get them all corrected in a big exercise. So we will be in touch with you about that. Um, if you're not a tier four pilot student, you can use that link to find out how to get your biometric residence permit corrected. And finally, for DPhil students, um, for technical reasons, even though you should have longer than this on your BRP, um, BRPs are expiring on the 31st of December 2024. We've only recently become aware of this problem. It is something to do with Brexit, apparently. But anyway, the Home Office have said they will be in touch with you to get your um, new BRP, but they won't be in touch with you until December, early, um, early 2024 about that so that's um something to dimly remember for the future but for now don't worry that you appear to have a slightly shorter visa than you thought you're going to get now and the other thing i need to say to you is please please keep your brp as safe as you can you're not required to carry it around with you in the uk so you can keep it somewhere safe rather than on your person or or in your wallet. So you only need it when you're traveling in and out of the UK with um, when you use it with your passport. You might need to show it to an employer um, to prove your right to work in the UK or to a landlord to prove your right to rent. But apart from that, keep it very safe in your room, particularly if you're traveling abroad, um, keep it very safe then. Um, if it gets lost, it's um, an additional problem for you, it, um, for example, if you've kept it in your wallet or purse and that gets stolen, then it's a, an additional thing you need to sort out. And we can help with that, but um, it's best not to lose it in the first place. Okay, if you can move the slide on, please, Ben. This is another requirement of your tier four visa, police registration. So this doesn't apply to any everybody. It's nationality based. There's um, pretty very little rhyme or reason to the nationalities that need to register with the police. But if um, the, all the nationalities required to register are on the le list on this slide, and you will have seen that you're asked to register um, within seven days. Again, that's an anxiety for people who need to self-isolate, but you don't need to go anywhere physically within seven days. You simply need to go online. So if you Google Thames Valley Police, that's our local area police, Thames Valley Police registration, and you'll find some web pages on how to register with the police. And for now, you just need to make yourself known to them. They're not running the appointments for registration anyway. So just make that first contact online and then you fulfill that requirement for now. And then don't forget about it long term. Just keep checking on the website to see when they will um, open up for the registration and going in to get your certificate. Um, so it's not something to worry about, unduly. Just be aware and don't forget it long term. Um, just aim to get it done sometime um, before the end of term if possible. Um, and then you do need to report certain changes to the police. So if you change address, you change course, you get a new passport, you get a new visa, you need to tell the police about that, keep that police registration certificate updated. But you should be able to do most of those changes online. They are in a bit of a, um, in a, bit of a, a shambles at the moment, but just keep an eye on that website and take action when they sorted themselves out and they can register you. Okay, so moving on to the next slide, please, Ben. Okay, student visa conditions. Um, now you must let your college take a copy of your biometric residence permit and passport. They're required to keep a copy of that. At the moment, I think they're letting you um, upload a scan of it for now, rather than coming in in person to do that. So. 
find out what your college requires you to do um, for that. Um, now, um, Chechi mentioned, I think, about your permission to work at, about your what the university lets you do regarding employment during your course. Um, the UK visas and immigration are actually rather more generous than that. They allow you to work up, up to 20 hours a week during periods you're supposed to be studying. So there's a maximum number of hours you can work. However, that doesn't mean, of course, that it's a good thing to work that number of hours. Um, your studies come first. But on the visa side, you can work up to 20 hours a week during periods of study. And then undergraduates and taught master's students can work full time during vacations if you want to. Um, but there are limits to the types of employment you can do. And you can't be self-employed or set up a business while you're on tier four. Next, you need to be aware of the expiry date on your visa. That's the end date on your VRP, because you mustn't stay beyond that end date without taking action. So if you uh, do want to stay in the UK lobby, you have to have um, lodged a new visa application before your VRP expires. And then be aware that certain changes will have knock-on effects for your visa. So if you suspend study, so if you withdraw from your course or transfer course or complete unexpectedly early, it will affect your visa. And my colleagues on the compliance side of the team will be in touch with you about this. But and also if you do make changes to your course, for example, you should be alerted that you need to get in touch to find out what effect that's going to have on your visa. Um, uh, it is a condition of your visa that you remain engaged with your course. So if you do withdraw from your course, then we need to be in touch with you. And that might need to be reported to the home, home office. If you have any questions or changes in your immigration status, please let your college know or ask, ask us about it so we can advise you what that, um, what that means for your tier four sponsorship and what you need to do. OK, so next slide, please. Now, this is just to mention everyone who's already got their visa or who has a pending application for it is going to have a tier four student visa. But just this year of all years, to make things more complicated, the Home Office have changed the student visa system from last Monday and they're no longer going to be called um, tier four student visas. They're just going to be called student visas. And there are some minor changes. Some nationalities now don't have to apply for academic technology approved approval scheme um, certificates. So that's an improvement. There's a, the visa time limit for study is removed for most postgraduate students. So if you wanted to go on to do another course afterwards, that might make it easier. The e European nationals are being brought into the visa system from the beginning of January next year. Um, it's easier to apply for a new visa because you might not have to show the funding requirements. And then the tier four pilot scheme closed on the 5th of October, but that obviously doesn't affect um, students um, who already have their um, pilot scheme visa. So if you've already got your visa, this is just for interest, really. OK, so Ben, could you move on the slide, please? I'm sorry, I'm aware that we're running a bit late. OK, so just for European nationals. Now, if you're a European national and you're starting your course um, this mid-commerce term, all we advise is that you do apply under the EU settlement scheme for the European and Swiss nationals. So this applies to people who start residence in the UK before 11 p.m. 31st of December 2020. So that's a significant time and date. So if you get here to start residing by that time, you can apply for the EU settlement scheme live, study and work in the UK and use the National Health Service, National Health Service um, and you will be granted settled or pre-settled status. So most people will get pre-settled. Settled is only if you've already been resident here for five years. Um, now, the significance of this is it preserves your European free movement rights that you would have had 
um, before Brexit. So it's, it preserves and demonstrates your rights applying under the scheme. The application is free. It doesn't, of course, commit you to staying in the UK. So really, there's no drawback to making this application. And we do advise people to do it. Um, uh, and it prevents you needing to apply for a visa. And it will give you long term status in the UK if you do want to stay here. OK, so. Um, 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 Passing on to my colleague, James, now to talk to you about bank accounts in the National Health Service. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, my name's James Tibbet. I'm the head of the Student Immigration Information Office. Um, I'm conscious we've only got about five minutes left. So um, I'll try and wrap up the next few slides fairly quickly. And then if you do have any immigration questions, health questions about bank accounts, you can come and talk to Joe and my colleagues on the International European Students Stand. And we're in the commercial hall in the Fretter Fair, and we'll be there till eight o'clock tomorrow. So um, I'm going to talk about bank accounts first of all. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, we've been talking to the banks over the summer, and there's a a guide on the website which explains all the documents you need and they'll also let you upload documents so you can do most of the process online so do have a look at that guide um, you'll need a copy of your passport you can take a picture of your university card and upload that and then also your student enrollment certificate um, if the bank does ask for you to stamp and get the student enrollment certificate signed um, tell them that we agreed with the branch manager that wasn't necessary. Um, sometimes they need a few reminders about that. So we agreed that you'd upload the enrollment certificate without a stamp or signature, and that you'd upload a copy of your university card as ID. Uh, some of them will accept the 90 day sticker if you're having trouble collecting the BRP. And then they might arrange a phone call or use a phone app to check your identity online. Um, as I've mentioned there, you'll need the bank account for paying fees or joining clubs. So it's a good idea to set one up early on. Um, so the final point on finances, um, be quite careful of any telephone or email scams uh, where they're asking you for money or personal details. Some of them are quite sophisticated. So if you're at all wary about something, ask a UK friend or ask us if it's a visa issue or ask your college if it's anything else. Uh, we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, I'll talk about healthcare and the next slide. So just explain a few differences for the UK context. So if you've got a tier four visa and you've paid the immigration health surcharge, then you're covered for NHS services. And if you're an EU or EEA national, then you've got the EHIC card and then you're covered for that way and for the NHS. Uh, make sure you register with the doctor. The college will help you with that when you first enroll. So they've got your medical history. Um, after you've enrolled, they'll provide you with the NHS number. And that's also required if you need a COVID test at a later date. Um, there is also the university testing system, which you might have heard about in the talk earlier today. And then just briefly in terms of sort of in order of severity, if you do need um, some hospital treatment or to talk to the nurse. Um, you've got the college nurse you can contact or you can phone 111 if it's a non-urgent issue and they'll tell you whether you need to go to the doctor or go to the hospital. Or and you can also adv ask advice of the chemist. Um, if you're referred to a doctor, that's the general practitioner. And at the moment, it's mostly video consultations or they might arrange an appointment for you to come in and that will all be secure. The accident and emergency, um, that would be if, for example, you, you broke an arm or an ankle and you would go to the John Radcliffe Hospital. Again, if you're not sure, you can call 111 if it's non-urgent and they'll give you advice on what to do. And then if it's an emergency, it's that 999 number. Um, the charges are there about what you'll need to pay. So all your healthcare is covered, apart from prescription charges if you need medicine. And then you also have to pay for the dentists and the opticians. Um, dentists can be NHS or private. 
And then you'll find a lot of information on Ukiza. It goes through the whole charging structure and how all this works. So, so do have a look on there as well. And then, then the next slide. And, and then just finally some advice. There's a university website uh, for new international students. There's a list of things for you there to check and settle in. Uh, the student immigration team, come and talk to us on the stand or email us. And we'll give you, um, we'll send you an update in week five of each term with some useful information about what's happening. Um, UKISA I've mentioned already, some very useful advice there for international students settling in. And then just finally, um, two other points before we finish, because I'm conscious it's three o'clock now. Um, we will send you the student news once a week. So there are a lot of things happening at the moment, but please do read the student news once a week. So that will cover exams, academic, social, um, everything going on in the university. So skim it, scan it, read it, and um, that will give you lots of updates. And then as, as Helen mentioned, in terms of academic or health issues or anything else, um, sort of seek advice early. There's lots of people to ask and they can give you um, advice about what to do for the next steps. Um, so sorry that was a bit brief because I'm conscious about the time, but um, do come and talk to us on the stand. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we are just about out of time. What we're going to do is we are going to take all the questions and pass them over and James and Tim will be answering them all um, on the on the chat of the of their stool. So if you head over to the commercial stand, head over, look for the, v, the visas. Um, um, it's inter there. international and European students, it's called. There you go, international European students. Head over there. What we'll do is we'll remove all your names just so you've got the generic questions. We'll make sure you've got all those questions there. So um, they'll be answered by the team. Um, 